All right, so chapter four, we have moved along in the book of Revelation. However, we still are in the first half. Remember, the book of Revelation divides neatly into two halves, chapters one through 11, and then chapters 12 through 22. Both halves of the book of Revelation teach the exact same, uh, tell the exact same story. Uh, one is taught from the earthly perspective, the first story. The second story, which is the same meaning, it's the same story, is taught from the spiritual background. And so we're in that first half, chapters 1 through 11. Very specifically now, we are no longer in chapters 1 through 3, Christ among the lampstands. Now we have moved to the throne scene. It's chapters 4 and 5. And specifically tonight, chapter 4, we're looking at God on the throne. Sunday, we're going to look at chapter 5 uh, that has to do with Christ. So as we look at this, though, let's just note some things about chapters 4 and 5. We're going to cover that in two classes, but they form one unit. This is really, really important that you remember this, that although we're going to cover it in two classes, it is one unit. And we need to remember that we need to take them as one unit and think about it as one unit. It is called the throne scene. That's how it's referred to, this section of the book of Revelation. Chapter 4, uh, the, in chapter 4, the focus is on God the Father on the throne. Okay, so in the book of Revelation, in chapter 4, it's God the Father who is on the throne. And chapter 4 focuses on him. Chapter 5 that we're going to talk about on Sunday focuses on Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God. Okay, and so that's what we're going to talk about on Sunday. This section, chapters 4 and 5, are introduced by chapter 3, verse 21, that last, almost the last, the second to the last verse that we just read, where it's written, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. And then immediately, chapter 4, you get that throne scene, okay? One disadvantage, one disadvantage to what we're doing when we study Revelation in this way, uh, in, in bits and pieces, is that we forget sometimes how it all how it all comes together and how it's all meant to come together. And so uh, we need to just remember that as we go through the chapter. All right, we're going to look um, a little bit more here, chapters four and five. Uh, Osborne, in his book on Revelation, says it is a kaleidoscope of Old Testament images with no single one dominant. And I will tell you, as you go through chapters four and five, there are just tons of things there that are coming out of the Old Testament. There are similarities in these chapters to Daniel chapter seven, to Ezekiel chapters one and two, and Isaiah chapter five, verses one through four. In short, Osborne says, the throne room of chapter four is at the center of the imagery of the book. So chapter four is pretty important. And we're going to spend some time with that as we go through this lesson this evening. Now, what I want you to do, and this, this is a little bit more effective when we're doing this in person, but we don't have that luxury tonight, is what I want everyone at home to do. And I really want you to do this. I want you to close your eyes, close your Bibles, Okay, you don't need to read along with me right now. You'll get a chance in just a moment to do that. But I want everybody to just close your eyes and I'm going to read the entire chapter. And I want you to focus on the words of the book and let those words form in your mind the images that are found here, okay? Um, we get away from this. We are such a television society that we get away of letting spoken and written words form pictures in our mind. But I want you to do that with me right now. So go ahead and close your eyes. Let me read chapter four. After this, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. 
And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders fall down before him, before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, O Lord, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. Okay, open your eyes. Were you able to form some images in your mind as we read through that text? Remember the first Christians. First of all, John, he sees the vision. He hears the vision. Then he writes it down. The first Christians would have been assembled together in their congregations. A letter comes from John. It would have been read aloud in the assembly. They wouldn't have had their own copies to follow along with. So as they're hearing the words written, they would have formed those images in their mind. One reason that I think the book of Revelation is spectacular is not just because of its message, but because how that message is conveyed to the reader. Chapter 4 is one of those kinds of chapters. So let's look at this. We're going to kind of divide this up into pieces now like we're, like we're typically going to do in this class in the book of Revelation. We saw the overview. Now let's look at the component parts. So verses 1 through the beginning of verse 6, the first half of verse 6, we have a description of the Father and the elders. In verse 1, John is called up here into the throne room of heaven. That is an incredible blessing. Not many people in the history of mankind have had opportunity to see inside the throne room of heaven in a vision. We see Isaiah seeing that. We see Ezekiel somewhat seeing that. Uh, at least in the first two chapters, it's something similar to the throne room. And here in the book of Revelation, John gets to see inside the throne room of heaven. There are visual elements to the vision. Did you notice this? There's the one on the throne. He's described, he's described as having the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. Around the throne, there's a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. You know, back before rain, the rainbow got appropriated to uh, a godless movement, the rainbow, the rainbow symbolized God's covenant with Noah and his family and with all of mankind after the flood. Here we have a rainbow around the throne with the appearance of an emerald. So it's, it's greenish in some way. It's not like the, the rainbows that we're familiar with. That rainbow there represents God's covenant with mankind, not just in the flood, but I would suggest to you a covenant that's made in Jesus Christ as well. Then we have the elders that are found here. There are 24 of them. Their appearance is given. They're clothed in white garments and they have golden crowns on their heads. And then in with all of this, we have the lightning that's taking place. And so you can think of the flashes that are going on, the flashes of lightning. Again, God is associated in the Old Testament particularly with storms. We see that here as well, this lightning that's happening in the throne room of heaven. And then there are seven torches there as well, which the text tells us represent the seven spirits of God, or they are the seven spirits of God. And we've talked earlier in the book of Revelation that that's talking about the Holy Spirit. There's that number seven again, perfection. And then we have in front of the throne, something like a sea of glass. 
I don't know what that must have looked like, but it must have been beautiful. So we see the one on the throne, that's God. We see the rainbow, the elders, the lightning, the seven torches, and the sea of glass. But it isn't just visual elements to the vision, because there are audible elements to the vision as well. What does John hear? He hears a voice like a trumpet. Who is that voice? It's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one speaking there. So there's that voice of a trumpet. There are rumblings, the ESV says. Now, if you've got a New American Standard or a New King James, you may have it translated as voices or sounds. That word has a fairly wide number of meanings, and so the translator has to, has to translate. Uh, he translates it as rumblings. I think that he's probably, the ESV is probably translating that to go, uh, that it's an indistinct sound, okay? And what the voices say or what the sounds say is not described. In conjunction with that, you have the peals of thunder. Makes sense because you've got lightning. And so where there's lightning, there's thunder. Now take in conjunction with that, let's take our Bibles, uh, hold your spot there in Revelation chapter four, but take your Bibles and go back to the Old Testament with me, if you will. And let's look at Exodus chapter 19 and verse 16. In Exodus chapter 19 and verse 16, Notice the language that's used when the, when the people are encamped at the foot of Mount Sinai. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. There are three elements in that verse that are found right here in Revelation chapter four. We are meant to make that connection. We are meant to understand the connection between what's going on in Revelation and what's going on in the Old Testament when God has met with his people. The Old Testament is very, very important in the book of Revelation. All right, go ahead and take your Bibles and go back to the book of Revelation. Uh, we'll continue on here in this text. So Revelation chapter 4, what's important about this, these first six verses, first six um uh, Verse 6 up to the first half of verse 6, I should say, is that God on the throne is in marked contrast with Caesar on his throne. Remember what's going on in the book of Revelation. Christians are being called upon to worship the Roman emperor on pain of death if they refuse. It was a loyalty test. It was done so that they could say, are you loyal to the Roman empire or not? Are you a good citizen? For the Christian, it meant worshiping a strange God, a strange deity. And so that was the problem for Christians. They wouldn't do that. They were loyal citizens, but they would not bow down before the emperor. God here in chapter four, now that the churches have been addressed, the focus turns to God. And we are meant to see God on the heavenly throne that is far, he is far greater than anything that Caesar could ever have built in Rome. And there were some pretty spectacular buildings in Rome. They pale in comparison to the throne room of God. So Christians reading this letter, Christians today, when we're called upon to compromise our beliefs by the state, look to the God who sits on the throne of heaven as the one we're going to be loyal to. All right, let's continue on here in the chapter. Uh, let's look at verses six, uh, the second half of verse six into verse eight. So just uh, two and a half verses here where we have the four living creatures. Now these four living creatures that are described here, there are similar elements, but also different from four creatures that are described in Ezekiel chapter one and also Isaiah six, where they are called seraphim, but cherubim in Ezekiel chapter 10. Sometimes I get the question, and I do that Q and A, uh, at the church once a month um, as a sermon on Sunday evenings. And I sometimes get the question, what's the difference between a seraphim, a cherubim, and an angel? Okay, and we have to go to these texts to answer that question. Um, but you get these four creatures here, and they are very similar to what we see in two significant Old Testament passages. We don't have time to read those, but we are going to look at some elements from them. Okay, so... Um, they surround the throne here in Revelation chapter four. They are described as being full of eyes. Each has six wings. One is in the form of a lion. One is in the form of an ox. One is in the form of a man. And one is in the form of an eagle. Okay, so 
The lion has six wings. The ox has six wings. The man has six wings. The eagle has six wings. Okay, These four creatures have sometimes been used to symbolize the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's um, icon... That's, that's, that's a series of icons that have existed for a long time among believers. They just became associated with that. That's not what the scripture is talking about. We're going to see some illustrations here in just a moment, but I want to point this out, that regardless of how they've been associated with the evangelists, there's no association with the evangelists here in the book of Revelation. Okay, um, Their praise that's given to him who is on the throne, which is God the Father, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who is, I'm sorry, who was and is and is to come. There's a three time, there's three times the word holy is said here. It's the divine holiness, it's expressing the divine holiness. Three is the divine number. And so these creatures say all the time, constantly they're crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. If you think that the throne room of God is going to be a quiet place, Revelation says otherwise because this description says there are these creatures and that's what they're doing all the time is praising God. All right. So I promised you an example of this illustration. Uh, these illustrations that I'm going to pull up are from the Lindisfarne Gospels. They come from Northumberland, England, and they date to 700 AD. So this is 600 years after the book of Revelation is written. It's 1300 years ago for us, but it's very, very old. So notice how Matthew is depicted at the beginning of his gospel. There he is sitting and writing his book. And above him, there is a creature in the form of a man with wings. That's coming from this text in the Revelation. Then we have Mark. Mark is sitting there as well, writing his gospel. And above him, we have a lion with wings. Then we have Luke. He's sitting there writing his gospel. He gets associated with the ox with its wings. And then finally, we have John. Uh, I guess he's finished writing his gospel because he doesn't have a pen in his hand. Um, and he's associated with that eagle up there at the top. So these four evangelists were associated with these four creatures. Again, that is not what we find in Revelation, but you see this over and over. In fact, you see it a lot, not just here in these Lindisfarne Gospels. This is a photograph from St. Mark's Basilica in Venice. And that is the lion with wings that was associated with Mark the Evangelist. The book that he's holding there, the Latin inscription says, Peace to you, Mark, my evangelist. And of course, Mark was the patron saint of Venice, and he became the symbol of Venice. That lion with those wings became the symbol of Venice. And so if you go to Venice, you're going to see that in several places. If you travel up and down the Adriatic and stop and visit any of the towns that historically belonged to Venice, you're going to see that kind of icon as well because it was associated uh, they associated themselves with Mark. So these creatures in Revelation are pretty powerful symbols and people have used them in various ways since this time. What we need to get out of this is that they are there in the throne room of God praising God. All right, let's compare these creatures. We have Revelation chapter 4, Isaiah chapter 6, Ezekiel chapters 1 and 10. In Revelation chapter 4, we read that they have four, I'm sorry, six wings in Isaiah chapter 6, we read that they have six wings. In, Eze in Ezekiel chapters 1 and 10, they're identified as having four wings. In Isaiah chapter 6, we read that they have hands. Revelation doesn't mention hands. In Ezekiel 1 and 10, we read that they have hands. Then in Revelation chapter 4, we read that they praise God. That's what we just saw in that chapter. In Isaiah chapter 6, they're praising God, just like the creatures in Revelation chapter 4. In Ezekiel chapters 1 and 10, they actually carry God's throne. And if you studied Ezekiel with me, you know that we've spent time in chapters 1 and 2 and chapter 10, where we talk about God's war wagon, his mobile throne that goes all over the earth. It's being carried by, by these creatures. In Revelation chapter 4, we read that they're full of eyes. Isaiah 6 doesn't mention that. Ezekiel chapters 1 and 10 mention that they're full of eyes as well. Then in Revelation chapter 4, we have the form of a lion, an ox, the face of a man, and an eagle. Isaiah doesn't describe it, 
uh, in that way. Ezekiel chapters 1 and 10 describe a human form, but each has four faces. And those four faces are a human, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. Does that look familiar? In Ezekiel, the faces are described as having that form, those four forms. In Revelation chapter 4, the entire creature is described as having those forms. Then in Ezekiel 1 and 10, we read that their feet are hooves. And so they have feet like a cow or feet like a horse, okay, hooves. In Revelation chapter 4, they are simply called the four living creatures. In Isaiah chapter 6, they are called the seraphim. In Ezekiel chapters 1 and 10, they are called the cherubim. Seraphim, by the way, is plural. The singular is seraph. Cherubim is plural. The singular is cherub. Okay, so these are the descriptions that we get. If you ask me, are they one and the same? I would answer that in my view and in my opinion, they are absolutely one and the same. These are the same creatures. Revelation chapter 4 is the throne room of God. Isaiah chapter 6 is the throne room of God. Ezekiel's chapter 1 and 10 is God's mobile throne, if you will, moving to and fro throughout the earth. I think the creatures are the same. They're just described differently in the three passages. All right, let's go ahead and look on in the chapter. I want to keep an eye on my time. All right, so let's look at verses 9 through 11. We've got a few more minutes, all right? The elders here praise the Father. Notice the number. There are 24 elders. We talked about numbers in the book of Revelation. Numbers are significant. 24 elders represent the complete and total number of God's people. 12 plus 12, plus 12 equals 24. They represent the 12 Jewish Old Testament tribes. They represent the 12 New Testament apostles. Have you ever wondered why it was that Jesus chose 12 apostles? Why didn't you choose 11? Why not 9? Why not 6? Why not 13? He chose 12 on purpose. Those 12 apostles are supposed to remind us of the 12 Jewish tribes. In Revelation, they get combined together to represent the complete and total number of God's people. Righteous Jews who died before the coming of Christ will be in the throne room of God. Righteous Christians who've died since the coming of Christ will be there in the throne room of God. Those are the 24 elders and that's how that number comes apart. Numbers are very significant in the book of Revelation. These 24 elders then do what? They join the living creatures in praising the Father. If you want to know what we're going to do in heaven, we're going to praise God. I think that's really, really important. Some people have this notion of heaven that we're not going to do anything. It's just going to be an eternity of reading magazines. I don't know. Or it's going to be an eternity of fishing. Or it's going to be an eternity of doing whatever it is we'd like to do on earth. Being in heaven means we're going to praise God. And I think when we find ourselves in that throne room, there isn't going to be anything boring about it. These elders join the living, preacher, living creatures in praising the Father. They cast their crowns before the throne, thus acknowledging him, as Haley says, Homer Haley says in his, in his commentary, acknowledging him as the source or cause of, of their salvation and victory. We're throwing our throne, we're throwing our crowns at your feet because you are the one that has allowed us to be victorious. Let's look on here in these last verses. They're praised to him on the throne. What do they say? Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. How many is that? Three. Receive glory and honor and power. It's the divine three. They could have given four things there, five things there, two things there. They gave three. Numbers are important in Revelation, not just, when, not just only when they're named, but also when we see things like that in sequence. We're going to more, notice more of that in chapter five. Worthy are you to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things. and By your will, they existed and were created. God is praised as the creator and only God is worthy of worship. You don't worship the living creatures. Oh, they were impressive. They must have been incredible to see. 
but you don't worship the living creatures. They are not worthy of worship. You don't worship the angels. Chapter 22, verses 8 and 9. Let's turn over there real quick here in Revelation. Chapter 22, verses 8 and 9. John is overwhelmed at the end of this. And he does something and he's corrected for it. John chapter 22, verses 8 and 9. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, with those who keep the words of this book, worship God. Angels are not worthy of worship. Not the living creatures, not the angels. And here's the message for the Christians in the seven churches and Christians throughout the world at the time and Christians today, a nation or an emperor are not worthy of worship either. We as Christians need to remember that we are first and foremost above everything else, citizens of the kingdom of God. And the king who sits on the throne is the one who demands our loyalty. He deserves our loyalty. And we cannot share that loyalty with anyone or anything else. That's Revelation chapter 4. As it turns out, I didn't keep you long tonight. We're actually done pretty much right on time, maybe with a couple of minutes to spare. Revelation chapter 4 gets us then uh, into um, the first half of that throne scene. Our next class, I'm about to pull up this slide. I hate this when I'm about to pull up a slide and I recognize that there's a typo. That is that the next class that we're going to look at is not Revelation chapter 4. It's Revelation chapter 5. So please read in anticipation of that class, Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. That's the entire chapter. One thing about the chapters in Revelation, they tend to be pretty short, 